Uh, Sister Bela, good to see you. She says, happy Sunday, family. All right. Can we pray as we commence the meeting? Father, we are grateful to you once again for the privilege to be alive. We thank you for your great kindness upon our lives. Father, it is unto you that we have gathered and we want to learn of you. We want you to prepare our lives. We want our lives to accomplish that which you have on your heart, O oh God. We want to live to please you, to glorify you. But that is the essence of our creation. We therefore plead, Father, that in your mercy, you will grant us access into your word. You will grant us revelation and a willing heart to obey thy word. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. First Peter chapter 2 from verse 12. First Peter chapter 2 from verse 12. Now, um, the last time we concluded with verse 11, but I need to remind you very quickly that in verse 9 and verse 10, we were told who we are now in Christ and what we have obtained, that we have uh, we are a peculiar people, we are a chosen generation, we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people to show forth the praises of God. All of this God had accomplished already on our behalf. All of this. He has accomplished it on our behalf. We didn't pay for it. It's not by our power. It's not by might. That's the good news. Now, it was on that basis that we were now told that we must abstain. Look at the word abstain. Okay? Abstain is not a struggling word. Abstain from fleshly lust that war against the, our soul. Okay? Now, it means that we already have victory. All we need to do is just to abstain. It's not to struggle. We are not struggling with sin. We are only abstaining from sin. An unsaved person is a sinner. I had somebody saying yesterday that how can, how can they say that everybody who is born is a sinner? And he was disproving it and he's a preacher. He was disproving it and he was reading some scriptures and even the scripture he was reading was actually saying something contrary to what he was teaching. But because the people have been brainwashed, they were all sitting down there healing him. He said, oh, how can God be just? How can I be born and be born a sinner? So we were not born a sinner. There's this, there's a simple way to, to even know. When you, when you give birth to a child, have you ever sat your child down to say, let me teach you how to lie? Have you ever sat anybody down? Did, did you ever go to a school where one of the courses you took in that school is fornication 101? Did you go to any school like that? Did anybody teach us how to be bitter? Did anybody teach us how to have malice? How come all the manifestations of the flesh came to us naturally? Because we are, we were sinners. But those of us who are now saved. As in, it's so simple. It's so easy to understand. That the nature of sin was already in man. The scripture makes this very clear. And that is why God being just also included us in the death of Jesus. The reality is that we were actually saved the day Jesus resurrected. But it is the day we now believe it that it becomes activated. Otherwise, Jesus will have to go and be dying each time you believe. So God is just. And it is, you see, human, it is because we don't know God that we think that we can use this our head to judge the justice of God. The human head cannot judge the justice of God. The way God works, the way God thinks, is far from our own way. He himself said it. He said, my ways are not your ways. As the heavens is far, so, so is my ways far away from yours. 
And when he says heaven, he's not talking about this sky that you see that is far. Is is the is the eternal nature of the universe that God is talking about? The eternal distance, the eternal nature of the universe, the heavens. He says, "So is my way far from your ways." So God is just. That's why I say, how do we know there is God? It's by faith. Then how do we know God is just? It's also by faith. If you want to work with God, you must first of all have faith. The scripture says God is good. You must have faith to believe that he is good. And then eventually you will see that God is good. You know? So we need to be careful. That's that You see, that's why we are doing what we are doing. You know, I've had people suggest that, oh, you know, we have been doing a lot of teaching, a lot of preaching. Now we should be praying. First, who told you we are not praying? See, prayer is not what we have been called to do. We have been called to teach the word of God. We will pray. That is in the closet. You see, prayer is, is in the closet. Preaching is in the open. So we are not going to bring our, our praying to the open. Sometimes people, people say to me that, all these people that are you praying for them? Are you praying for the church? I'm like, so do you want me to come and bring my prayer to the public and put it on social media to tell you that? Jesus said, when you pray, he said, enter into your closet. But when he came to preaching, he said, what I've told you in the secret, he said, declare it on the rooftop. Preaching is our public work. It's the major public work. You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. The only antidote to false teaching is truth. I can come and tell you that what this man is saying is wrong. But if I still don't show you what is right, you will still not know what is, what is right. I can tell you this equation is not correct. But that does not mean you still know the correct equation. That is why there is a difference between people who are beefing pastors and people who are burdened for the name of Jesus. There are two different kinds of people, but people can't differentiate them. I'm not an activist. I'm not a church activist. There are people that maybe why they were into organized religion. They may have been duped, manipulated by pastors. Many of them have now taken it upon themselves to go on social media. They have no other thing they are doing other than to keep speaking against a particular pastor. So if the person had attended MFM, all he will do is to, to go online and continue to discredit the man in MFM. If his experience was in redeem, that's all he will be doing. If his experience is in winners, that's all that he will be doing. And they are usually mostly Pentecostals. And so they go out when they see any videos that is that somebody is speaking against a pastor, against a preacher, they are quick to put it on their status. They are quick to also use it to do videos. Those people have beefs with pastors. Those people are not going to profit the church. They are not different from the people they are correcting. There's another category of people that have a burden. The way Elijah was burdened for, for the name of God. They have a body for the body of Christ. They are not against men of God. They are against wrong teachings, wrong doctrines. And that is what they kick against. It's for them, it's not a personal thing. They don't have any beef with any pastor or with any man of God. What they have is a body that has been developed in the place of consecration. A body that has been developed in the place of secrecy with God. Where God is pouring his heart into them and showing them what is wrong in his body. These people have a body. And how do you differentiate them? The people who have a body, they are out to teach the truth. Not just to criticize and expose false teachings or false men. But the other people, they are not preaching the truth. They are not going to come online and say, can we open our scriptures and then begin to teach people the truth? Because telling people that something is wrong does not mean they know what is right. Until you labor in the word of God to teach people what is the truth, they will still not know. 
People can see, you can release a video and say, this man is sleeping with another man's wife. This pastor is sleeping with another man's uh, wife. You can release that video. It can create a scandal. It doesn't mean people that goes to his place have come to know the truth. They've only known that this man is sleeping with another man's wife. And sometimes because they still don't know the truth, they may say, yes, he's human. And the next Sunday, in fact, his population will increase. So there is a responsibility to teach the truth. Jesus spent time teaching. You know, sometimes people just think that, oh, you are just talking. We are not talking. Otherwise, it means Jesus was also talking. What was recorded in the gospel? Was it the prayer of Jesus or the talking of Jesus? He spent time teaching. When he was living, he said, go and teach all nations. You know, that's one of the falsehood in our time is this concept that prayer is what we need. We need prayer. But prayer is not the bulk of our work. So you will see people going to a meeting. They say in this meeting we pray. They pride themselves as praying. They know nothing to the next, to the word of God. That's why they will continue to pray a prayer that is amiss. A prayer that does not strike any chord in the heart of God. And they will do it for years. Nothing will happen. Then you will see some of them. They will get tired. I said they want to try something else. Because Jesus said it is when you abide in me. And my words abide in you. That you can pray correctly. It means that you must know the word of God correctly. For you to pray correctly. Prayer is not an exertion of force. Prayer is simply speaking to God. Having known his mind. So until, until people are well taught, they have no defense against falsehood. That's why the scripture says, put on the whole armor of God. What are those armor? What is the belt of truth? What is the shield of faith? What is the sword of the spirit? That's the word of God. That's the word of God. What God gave to Adam to resist the serpent was his word. And it was because he failed at that, that he failed. Look at Jesus. Did he not pray for 40 days and 40 nights? Did he not fast? Did that stop devil from coming to him? No, he didn't stop it. Prayer didn't stop the devil from tempting Jesus. Fasting didn't stop the Satan from coming to Jesus. What was the defense? It was the word of God. It was until Jesus showed that he knows the truth that Satan left him. It doesn't matter how you pray. If you are ignorant, the devil will make a mess of your life. If you like, pray 24 hours every day. Speak in tongues. Do all those kind of things. Wake up at night. Don't even sleep. If you don't know the truth, you can never be free. We must know the truth to be free. Prayer is mostly, I'm not saying we cannot pray together or in the public, but prayer is mostly a private affair. But preaching is a public affair. So what you should be seeing in public is preaching. It doesn't mean they are not praying. It just means that that is the order. That it is preaching. Why are we in error? Because we don't know the truth. My people perish for lack of knowledge, not for lack of prayer. For lack of knowledge. Go and teach them everything whatsoever I have commanded you. That is a serious work. For anybody who takes the word of Jesus seriously, that's a serious work. A preacher said that uh, he told God, he said, give us 20 years to prepare men. You know why he asked for 20 years? I don't know the, the years. But I agree with him. It takes a long time to truly raise people for God. There are many things that are making people fall into error. You can only correct it by the truth. By teaching the truth. See, I don't have problem with, off, with false preachers. As long as you know the truth, there is nothing they can do to you. I have a sister. She will call me and say, sir, you know, I listen to this message. I now see that this man is lying. This is what he said. This is what he said. You know, and I feel very happy. Because she's right. Do you know why? She's been so fortified now with the word of God 
that she can pick error. She can pick error. So that sister, let her go anywhere. You can't deceive her again. Why? She's been taught the word of God. If you are not well schooled in the in, in scriptures, you will be deceived. That there is no alternative. No matter how much you pray, that's why Jesus spent his time teaching. His prayer was a private affair. His preaching was a public affair. In fact, all the prayer Jesus offered in public were very short. Some, not even up to a verse. The prayers that Jesus offered in the public were very, very short. What is very critical is to know the truth. It's a deception of Satan to give you an impression that see, what we need is prayer. All this talk, talk, it's not talk, talk. It is the word of God. This world, this entire world was framed by the word of God. Jesus came speaking. Jesus didn't organize a prayer meeting. Did you note that? Jesus didn't gather people and say, come, let's, let's meet, let's meet, let's pray. Let's be praying. Let's be praying. We must change things. Let's be praying. That's not what Jesus did. What did he do? He called people to himself and taught them sin. And taught them sin. And when he was living, he showed them the way, the secret. He said, you also go and do what I have done. Go and spend time teaching people. Even prayer has to be taught. Was he not the one that taught us how to pray correctly? Without knowing Jesus, there's no way we can pray correctly. But in Jesus, we have become new creation, chosen generation, a royal priesthood. On that basis, we can then abstain from fleshly lust. There are war against the soul. So first, the place of victory is internal. It's not external. It's not what people think of you first that matters. It is the victory you have on the inside. If you don't have victory on the inside and you are struggling on the outside, it's only lie. You know, I had a friend, it's late now. And um, in those days, we were in high school, secondary school. And every, uh, there was a time we would pray every 10 p.m. We would gather somewhere to pray. So we were very close. We shared the same bunk. So when we go to pray, I, we stand by each other and we'll be praying. And this is my friend. Every night we are praying. His major prayer is, Lord, deliver my heart from lust, from fornication, from, you know, all of those prayers. So one day I was like, because I, want, I will always be hearing him. I'm like, you, you don't have anything to pray for. All your prayer is lost, 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 lost. That brother knew what he was doing. Guess what? After we had left school and uh, we had finished university, and so one day he came to me and he told me, he said, there's something he wants to tell me, that he had a child. We were not married then. I said, how? He said, after we left secondary school, you know, he had a relationship and the lady got pregnant and they kept the child. I said, wow, what he was praying against that he spent time praying against, praying against, praying against, praying against. Eventually, that matter came up. And that is why we must understand the path of victory. That it is the internal battle that we must gain victory first. And then we can gain victory on the outside. And he simply says, abstain. Now, in verse 12, he now went further to say something. He says, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your word, by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Now, here's what he's saying. Don't forget that the, traje the trajectory that we are going, that first, Jesus had done something. He has made us everything he wants to make us. It is on that basis that we live fleshly lost. So we are not holy because we are trying not to sin. We do not sin because we have been made holy. Please don't forget that order. 
you are holy. That is why you must depart from sin. It is not departure from sin that makes you holy. It is the fact that you are holy that you must depart from sin. That is God's order. So we are not trying to be holy. We are walking in holiness. We are perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. Now, so having established in verse 11 that there is an internal battle you must first of all win. He now said that there is also something that must happen externally. So Christianity is personal, but it's not private. Christianity is personal, but it is not private. How you live outside now matters. Let me read that verse 12 from New Living Translations. It says, be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then, even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. He says we must live properly among the unbelievers. It is not sufficient to say, well, I have obtained from fleshly lust. I thank God for the victory I have in Christ Jesus. It is equally important how we live among unbelievers, not just among believers. That's why Christianity is personal, but it is not private. So all this Christianity that we cannot see it in the public square, something is wrong with it. All this Christianity that it is only in your room that your Christianity is strong. We cannot see your Christianity in the public square. Something is wrong. It is important how we live, even among unbelievers. But you see, what some believers do is that when they are among unbelievers who cannot examine their Christian life, they blend with un those unbelievers. When they are among believers, who can say, but ah, why are you doing this? Why is why are you living like this? Then they now try to pretend that okay, I'm also part of you. But the scripture is saying we must live properly. The way King James says, he said, having your conversation, that means your manner of life, honest among the Gentiles. If the unbelievers are doing things that are not proper, you should not join them to do it. So our victory is not just personal. It is also public. We have a personal victory, but we also have a public space to display our victory in the manner that we live. If you have overcome stealing in your heart, should it not show in the fact that you will not steal in the public? You will not join people to steal? Should it not show? So many times, so today you say you are voting for a Christian, you are voting for a Christian, but that Christian is stealing. How is it a Christian? He comes to office and he steals. How, how will you call that a Christian? How can you be a Christian and you are stealing money? When can we have governors that we only live on their salary and due allowances and we not touch a dime of public fund? What kind of Christianity is that that it is only when you now go to one church on Sunday and remove your cap and bow down like this and they snap your picture and people will say, ah, look at this politician. He's a Christian. These are the people we need. No. That man came in as a pauper. He left as a billionaire. How did he acquire money? What business was he doing when he was the governor that you acquired so much money? Our Christianity must have a public face. We have responsibility. To live properly among unbelievers. He says so that when they, even if they are, they don't like you, even if they hate you for no reason, they will see your life and glorify God. They will see our life is, is visible. It can be seen. The Christian life can be seen. If they are not seeing it, it's probably that it is not there. Because he says that, that even if they speak evil against you as evildoers, they may by your good works 
they may by your good works which they shall be whole. It will not be hidden. That is why the Bible says when you want to appoint something, someone into leadership in the church, he must have a good report among those that are outside, which means that unbelievers, we must check what do unbelievers think about them. Do you know that to appoint people as in leadership position in the church, we must also ask unbelievers. What do you think about this man? This man, eh, is a wayward man. That is not the kind of man you are appointing to leadership in the church. What unbelievers think of you matters. How they see you matters. They may say they don't like you, but they will not find any fault. They, they will say that she's, she's a fanatic. She's a fanatic. Where she's a, a, she's just, she's Jesus, 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 Jesus. But when it comes to work, she works very hard. She's very honest. She doesn't lie. But it's just this Jesus, Jesus, Jesus on her head. See, that's a great testimony. I want to ask you, people who are not saved, people who are unbelievers, people who are worshipping idol around you, what would they say about you? How would they describe your Christian life? Or you are drinking with them, engaging in all sorts of sensual partying with them. Then what's the difference? You see, one of the problems we are faced with Christianity is because unbelievers cannot see any difference between us. They are like, you are doing everything they are doing. You are pursuing everything they are pursuing. You wear the same clothes as they wear it. You share the same view like them. Except there's really nothing different. And that's a problem. If you, who are a royal priesthood, a new creation, if your life is not different from somebody who is by nature a sinner, and then that, that is a big problem. Christianity is personal, but it is not private. We must see it. If unbelievers should see it, how much more believers? We must see it. If we can't see it, it's not there. You can't do your Christianity in your heart. I say, me, I know. I know I love Jesus in my heart. I have believed in Jesus. And nobody can see it outside. That is... There is something wrong somewhere, my dear brothers and sisters. Did you know that for 30 years, nobody persecuted Jesus? <laughs> for 30 years, nobody persecuted Jesus. But the day he showed that he belongs to the Father, the day he showed, he began to speak of the kingdom. Immediately, enemies began to pile up. You see, sometimes the reason why you are going peacefully is because you are not for Jesus. When you are, when you become for Jesus, there are certain trouble that will come to you. That people will not like you. When you are just doing your own thing, say, well, me, I don't want any problem. I just want to serve my Jesus. You cannot just serve Jesus in your room. That Jesus must be seen on you in the public place. He said that we must have our conversation honest among the Gentiles. You cannot be doing things that they are doing and say that you belong to them. They ask you to wear a gay band, you wear it. How will you wear it? Imagine if every, everybody that professes Christian to be Christian in Europe, in America, in Canada, imagine if today they take a stand. That see, we are not against people. And people should understand something. We are not against gay. There's no difference between a gay and a liar. There's no difference between a gay and an adulterer. No difference between a gay and uh, a fornicator. Or somebody who has hatred. Or bitterness. Or envy. They are all manifestations of the flesh. The problem is when you ask me to acknowledge what is sinful as right, I cannot. You have a right to live the way you want to live. But to take a law that applies to me, to now say that law must acknowledge your own behavior to be right, then there is a problem. Because that law is going to apply to me. 
and I consider this to be sinful. If it is just left to what you are doing in your room, there is no problem. But many Christians in a lot of places have slept. And those things crept in. Quietly. Quietly. So that's why abortion is a serious issue in America. It should not be. It shouldn't be. It's because they want to use the law to impose certain things on everybody. If it is just left to everybody, it is God that will judge you whether you, you murder somebody or not. It's not us. It's not my duty. I will love you nonetheless. And I will preach to you nonetheless. But you want to use the instrumentality of a law that applies to everybody to now force it on us who do not subscribe to that, that we must do it. That's where the problem comes. A doctor should have a right to say, I cannot participate in abortion. Why must you compel a doctor to commit abortion? If it's against his faith to kill. But one of the mistakes Christianity made was to allow laws and government to come into issue that has to do with morality and personal work with God. We should not have had that. In countries where they don't debate abortion, it's not that abortion does not take place in those countries. But those who are believers, they are not for it, and they live their life like that. And those who want to do it, they do it with people who can do it for them. Simple. You see, the problem is once you give the law power, that's where the problem is. And Satan is Satan knows this very well. And so what he's doing in a lot of countries is to empower the law to be for sin. And that's what the Antichrist will do. But if we all if we all stand genuinely that we are for Jesus, we are against this. Do you know many of these things will not find their way? But we have slept ah long ago. We just pray that God will send us a midnight cry that will wake the foolish and the wise virgins. We have slept. So it says that when they behold, they will glorify God in the day of visitation. Now, in continuation of that thought, is that verse 13 that he now says, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. In other words, your Christianity cannot be private too. Let me read that verse 13. It says, for the Lord's sake, respect all human authority. Whether the king as head of state or the officials he has appointed. For the king has sent them to punish those who do wrong and to honor those who do right. It is in this light that we also obey civil authority. That's why as a Christian you should pay your tax. That's why as Christian you should obey traffic. That's why as Christians you should not drive without license. Do you know that we don't need the law of the society? To actually obey the society. A Christian. Taken from somewhere in Africa. And taken to Sweden. He may make mistakes. With. Certain laws that are not criminal. But that Christian. Will never be found guilty. Of criminal offenses. Even if he does not know one law in their books. Because by simply being led by the Holy Spirit, you want to do what is right. That's why I was saying that. See, you see, the people of the world, they have an advantage in that they can do anything. But you see, we have a greater advantage when we bring Jesus into our own situation. But the kind of advantage they have, they, we don't have it. Somebody can be driving without a driving license. They may not have passed their, their, their driving test. And then they are driving. You see? But you, you have not passed the driving test. 
but you know by the word of God that it will be wrong for you to be driving. So you won't want to violate the law. But somebody who does not know the Lord can do it. And then it will look like that person is progressing. Somebody who does not know the Lord can go and engage in, in fake marriage just to get paper to live in a country. You that you are a child of God, you know you can't do that. Did you know that as a child of God, you can't violate a visa term? You receive a visa of six months, multiple visit, visit, and you must not stay maybe more than a month on each visit. And that visa now, you have been in that country for 12 years. And then you say you are born again. Well, maybe you repented later. But you see, I tell you the truth as a Christian, you can't do that. You must honor your visa terms. I don't know why some people think this is not part of Christianity. How can you as a Christian, you say you are a Christian, you are born again, and then you receive visa six months and six years you are still in that country. That is illegal and it is sinful. The scripture says we must subject ourselves to civic authority. So imagine if Christians are true Christians. Some nations that have bad reputation will not have had bad reputation if many people that claim to be Christians are Christians. Because they will know that these people, if you give them visa, they will come back. Just imagine that we have that reputation that once they identify you as a Christian, they know they will give you visa because they know you will never violate your visa terms. But you will see Christians going to take pictures to plan fake weddings and they will take pictures and pile it and send it to embassy. And then those people will have the audacity to go and give testimony. I say, ah, God has done it. God has done it. Praise the Lord, brethren. I'm telling you, such testimony will bring a curse upon your life. You are not testifying to God. You are glorifying Satan. We must obey all authority. It will be wrong to violate even traffic laws. You know, I saw a video. A man got to the traffic, the traffic light. The traffic light signifies that he must stop. So he stopped. But every single vehicle that was coming, they kept on going. They didn't stop. They were just bypassing him and going, bypassing him. But this man stayed because the, the traffic light is on red. And this man kept waiting. And this man kept waiting. As I was watching the video, you know, suddenly something happened and I learned an important lesson. Did you know that at that point, that man looked like a fool? Every other person were going. He stayed there. But then suddenly, a vehicle came also and stopped behind him. Then another one came and stopped behind that one. Then another one came and stopped behind that one. And I saw that because of one man's obedience, Many people started becoming obedient. Even though initially he looked like a fool. And a lot of vehicles started complying because one man decided to comply. It's a great lesson. Stay. Stay in obedience. You may look like a fool for now. See, there are money you will lose because you don't want to sin. There are money you will lose because you don't have to say, we have done that lesson. To understand why it looks like the unbelievers have certain advantage. They do. But we have a greater advantage. It's just that we don't know how to bring our own advantage into our situation. In this world, you can only excel by the kingdom, not just by working hard. We will work hard. And then we will bring the dimension of our kingdom into it. That was how Daniel excelled in Babylon. That's how Joseph excelled. They worked hard. Joseph was hard working. You can't be head of a slave if you are not hard working. The guy was hard working. But finally what brought him to limelight was the wisdom of God. That he was able to interpret the dream of the king. He brought that dimension into it. And that's why it's 
I tell people who are into music, they say they are doing music ministry. See, if you are doing music ministry, you can't do it like the people of the world. You can't do it for money. Get a job. If you can't trust God to provide for you in that ministry without necessarily commercializing that ministry. You can't do it for money. Somebody is, people are asking you and say, come and lead us in praise worship today. You say, it is uh, 500,000. What are we paying for exactly? So if you know that you can't trust God, don't go into it. You can't do it like the people of the world. Today I see that Christians are receiving music awards. They are nominating Christians for music awards. I'm like, how? What is the basis? What are you going to measure to give award? How can you say this is the best song? Do you know the song that God has inspired? How will you say one is better than the other? Do you know why God inspired certain songs to be in certain ways? What will you be measuring? That means you are doing worldliness. Christians cannot do music awards. What are we awarding? That means we should be, a, we should be giving an award to pastors. We should be giving an award to ushers. We should be giving an award to security men. What are we awarding? Our reward is with the Lord. You can't give a word. No, we can't do those things. What are we awarding? Somebody, God can just inspire that person to sing a very short song. And that song will accomplish its purpose. Another person, God can give a melodious tune. That one will also accomplish its purpose. But you can't bring them and say, this is the song of the year. How is it the song of the year? As God told you, this is his own song of the year. A song that is sung unto the Lord, it is not for you as a man to judge that song. But we want to do things the way of the world. We want to do whatever they are doing. I don't understand how you will emulate the world. I don't envy the world. Rather, I even pity the world. So, brethren, we have responsibility to be obedient. He says, verse 14, or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. It's because somebody will be saying, oh, so if the government says that we should go and do evil, the issue is that, have they asked you to do evil? Essentially, governance is about Rewarding those who do right and punishing those who do wrong. If you obey rules, you don't have a problem. They won't put you in jail if you don't deal with drugs. When you deal with drugs, they jail you. When you do something of note, they give you national award. Essentially. We have not reached the point where they are saying renounce God. If they get to that, we can't renounce God. We have example in the scriptures. The same person that wrote this book, Peter, when they told him that he must not preach the gospel again, he said, judge for yourself. Shall we obey God rather than man? But on a general note, most of what we have in our society does not contradict God. They are just matter of obedience. But it is when a matter directly put, or put you at loggerheads against God, that's where you must stand for God. But generally speaking, there are just rules here and there that you are to follow. See, sometimes following rules can be tedious. <laughs> it can be difficult. We will see other people moving very fast. When I was writing my thesis in my last year in the university, God, it was, it was a tough experience for me. In fact, if you don't know Jesus, sometimes some event may make you to want to give up on Jesus. My set had graduated, they have gone, I'm still there working on my thesis. You know why? I do not want to lie. I can't quote something that I don't have a reference for. Other people can do, in fact, I know people that academically they are not close to me. But before you know it, they were done with their thesis and they were gone because they simply took an old one 
modify it, submit it, and declare them. I couldn't do that. So it was difficult. I had to do proper research. I had to get my data. I had to do my analysis. I had to prove that every references I made, they exist. So it was tedious for me. I had to pay for late submissions. And I paid heavily because they were charging me every single day after the expiration date for submission. They kept charging that this is how much you are going to pay. If you knew how much I paid, <laughs> it wasn't easy. But I thank God I went through it. It helped me to understand thesis. My thesis wasn't fake. I did it for myself. I recited it. So I truly learned from it. I'm not like people who just took one and copied and did, you know, plagiarism. Do you know that plagiarism is wrong? You can't do that as a Christian. And plagiarize other people's work and claim it as your work. It is not proper. Did you know that it is not proper to be attending prayer meeting when you should be at work? You know it's not proper. <laughs> It's not spirituality. It's foolishness. Monday morning, when you should be at work, you say there is, there is, there is early morning prayer somewhere. Or you are coming late because you are attending one prayer meeting somewhere. Why not leave that job and be attending the prayer meeting? It's not proper for you as a Christian to be coming late to work. It's not proper for you to resume work. 8.30, and then go and sign that you resume work 8 o'clock. It is a sin. We must obey authority. <laughs> the, that life of Jesus must be seen in us. Verse 15 says, so, he said, for so is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. There are some men you can't keep their mouth shut until your life proves something to them. It is as we live like this that those men, their mouth can be kept shut, evil men. But you are condemning them, yet your own life does not in any way speak righteousness to them. So I want to stop here. I'm going to stop here. Brethren, all, you see, it, you know when we're looking at verse 9, we're excited. A chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him. That is something that all of that must show. It must bring praises to God. We must show forth something. And that is what we are saying now. It now matters how we live our lives. See, brethren, if you tell somebody it's two o'clock, ensure it is two o'clock. Except it is beyond you, humanly speaking. If you borrow money, return it. There's somebody to borrow you money and you will not talk about it again. It's wickedness. It's not proper. That, that's not how a Christian lives. He said, please, 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 can you just help me with uh, 500 pounds? And that person struggled to give that money to you. You say, by end of this month, I'll pay it back. It's one year now. You don't even talk about it. You don't even, you, you pretend as if you never collected money from this person. And that same you, you are the one that is leading prayer in church. And once you pick microphone, hey, 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 please stop making noise. All your tongues, you can't do right. You can't do what is right. What is the essence of your tongues? You must do right. You will see how, you will see, see everything we will be reading subsequently is because of this verse 9. You will understand scripture. By the time we get to chapter 3 that is talking about marriage, it is because of verse 9. It's because of who you are in Christ. What God has made you to be. The conduct of your life afterwards. When you check the discourse 
of many of the epistles. That's what it follows. That's the pattern. They show you who you are in Christ. Then they now show you that because you are this person in Christ, then this is how you are to live. Then you now continue to live like that. But we have pastors today, many preachers, they don't care. Or they will tell you, I lift somebody today by, by my anointing. I, I lift you from poverty to financial breakthrough. The same you that come, that comes late to work. The same you that inflate prices. The same you that if something is hundred dollars, you will say it's one thirty dollars. That same you is lifting you into financial prosperity with its anointing. Now lie, it will not work. <laughs> yeah, you are deceiving yourself. It cannot work. So, brethren, it is a privilege to be a royal priesthood. But we must show it. How can you say you are royal? Just imagine that King Charles of the United Kingdom, he comes out and is misbehaving. Do you know that by virtue of that office, there are character that is expected of him. He can't just behave anyhow. And that is a worldly king. How much more you now that you are a royal king, eternal king, and heavenly king, because he has made us kings and priests. That's why we are a royal priesthood. It's a privilege. We now need the grace of the Lord to manifest who we are in the marketplace. Let us pray. I don't know in what way the Lord may have spoken to you, but respond to him. Some of you after this message may have to make certain corrections. There are things you have been doing wrong. It never occurred to you that as a Christian, you can't even do those things. Laziness is not part of Christianity. You are lazy at work. And yet the same you, you are attending all night prayer. I would rather first that you go and deal with that your laziness. You just want to be sleeping at home. Everybody is working, but you want to sleep at home. And you think that's okay. You get to work and you are clocking in wrong time. Because they do not have technology where you are working that, that will not give you room to clock in a wrong time. You don't need that technology to be obedient. Why not go before the Lord today and say, Lord, I'm sorry. Why not repent today? Everything the Lord has been pointing out, why not repent? I say, Lord, I didn't understand it this much. It's not out to kill you. <laughs> it's out to save us. See, when God speaks like this, it is to help us. It's not to condemn us. It is to convict us. It is to bring us to repentance so that we can align with him. So that he can be of help to us. It is God that wants to help us. Whenever you see God speaking against sin, that means God wants to help your life. Because God does not want anything that will destroy you or that will pull you down. God is saying, you see, you are too honored. Do you know who you are? A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a chosen generation, a peculiar people who have obtained mercy, the people of God. You must carry yourself that way. That's what God is saying. I want you to live like my royal priest. I want you to live like a chosen generation. I want you to live like a holy people. If I call you a holy people and your, your character and conduct is unholy, how then can God be glorified? So just go before him and repent. If you need grace, ask him for grace. If you need wisdom, ask him for wisdom. Ask him for help. He is available. He said, he said that the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. He said, therefore, let us come boldly to the throne of grace where we might obtain mercy and find and find help and find grace to help in time of need grace is available sufficient grace is available so you can ask and say lord i just need your grace i now know that i'm a holy nation i'm a royal priesthood and so you want me to conduct myself like that Earthly kings, they don't behave anyhow. 
Hey, have you noticed that? Even priests, people who are priests of different occult groups, do you know they don't behave anyhow? They class themselves. Their conduct many times are impeccable. How much more you that you are a priest unto God? We need to show the world that we are a priest unto the heavenly king. Thank him for the way he has spoken to us. Commit your week into the, into the Lord's hand or your day as it may be. That as you go forth, you will show forth his places. Everywhere you turn, people will glorify God. Everywhere you go, people will honor the name of the Lord. Let's round up our prayers. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. And so, Father, we are grateful to you once again. Father, you have shown us great mercy. I know certain things, Lord. And others may not see this. But Father, I know without a doubt in my heart that we have obtained mercy. Lord, we truly say thank you. We thank you, Father. This is God who has come true for us, not man. And Father, we are deeply grateful to you. Father, it is our desire and our prayer. Because it's a great honor to be your priest, to be your king, to be a chosen people by you. Father, it is our prayer that henceforth, our lives will show forth your praise. I therefore, Lord, pray for your children, O Lord, that, Father, as we go this week, your word says goodness and mercy shall go with us. Father, we seek that. We also seek that our lives will glorify you. Some of us may be sick. Some of us may have diagnoses that are troublesome. Father, I pray, Lord, that the healing virtue of Jesus will rest upon everyone. I pray, Lord, that none, O oh God, shall be involved in mishap, in accident. You will keep our going. You will keep our coming. Many of them are trusting you for jobs. I pray, Father, you will open doors for them. It will be you opening it. Door where they will glorify your name. Door where they will not fall into sin or fall back into worldliness. Lord, you will grant them access. Many of them have difficult situations that if you don't come through for them, there is nothing they can do. Father, for every such cases, we pray that your mercy will reach out to everybody, O oh Father, and you will uphold them and you will sustain them and carry them through in the name of Jesus. Some of them are worried over their children. Some of them are worried over their families. We pray that whatever this will be, we pray that your light will shine upon those children. Your light will shine upon their families. Father, we are grateful to you. We bless you. Perhaps there could be some who may even be on hospital bed who are not able to join or who are not able to listen. Lord, we pray that your spirit will rest upon them and you will bring them out of that place to show forth the praise of your holy name. Thank you, gracious and merciful Father. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen.